English translation, but it's a good one. If you got the Wooten translation, one of the reasons I chose it is because every time Machiavelli uses the term virtue, even if they use a different word, so as not to get too repetitive, they put virtu in brackets, okay? So, so that you know how often Machiavelli uses that term. And he uses it in a very different way. In some ways, the opposite of, of the normal meaning, okay? So back in Machiavelli's day, the term virtue mean, meant something like what we would use it now to mean, which is morally virtuous, and in particular in Italy um, during the Renaissance, that would probably be attached to some notion of Christianity, um, and so the two wouldn't be completely separable, okay? And yet, Machiavelli tells us that this man here, Cesare Borgia, who we'll talk more about next time, um, is a virtuous prince. Even though some of you may know if you've watched the Borgias or if you've studied up on um, this family at all, this man was not morally virtuous, okay? He did all kinds of things. Some of them were just self-indulgent, you know, and some of them were for political and military reasons that he felt like he had to do. But one thing we can say about Borgia is he never had a reputation for being morally good, and that's despite the fact that at some point, I think he became a priest. And we'll talk more about this in the future too, that the church was kind of messed up at this time and um, sometimes what happened within it was more politically motivated than it was um, religiously motivated, okay? So we'll talk about Borgia on uh, Wednesday. But what we're gonna talk about today is actually even a little bit more, I don't know, like disturbing and gives you a feel for the problematic nature of religion at this time. Um, Machiavelli is writing during, during the time that precedes, by not too much, but precedes the, the Protestant Reformation, okay? But the problems that, that created the Protestant Reformation were starting to, you know, they were really showing, okay? And Machiavelli, is among those who have become kind of cynical about religion, we might say. Maybe largely because of the church's behavior at the time, uh, which was often more politically motivated. And you'll see him using examples from uh, the church and, and citing you know, popes as though they're political actors, evaluating their success or failure, not on the basis of their religiosity, how well they could use their military forces that, that they could summon or um, their influence in some way, right? Because the church was, was a political and a military power at the time, okay? Anyway, the cynicism that's developing about religion and what it's good for and what it's not good for is showing in Machiavelli's <laughs> book, The Prince, here, okay? And a great example of that is in chapter six, where Machiavelli deals with, with multiple leaders, but he particularly I want to focus in on how he deals with Moses, okay? Now, if you don't happen to be a Christian or you don't happen to be Jewish and you, or Muslim, because all three, you know, um, embrace the Old Testament, what Christians call the Old Testament, if you're just not very religious, you may not know too much about this um, figure of Moses. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that so that everybody kind of knows what the story is that people of Machiavelli's time would have been familiar with. Everybody would have known that Moses was probably the greatest prophet, if, or at least one of two or three of the greatest prophets, and that he was the one who... Uh, more or less founded Israel, took Israel, the people of Israel, the Hebrews or the Jews, out of enslavement in Egypt, 
and took them on this long journey out in the wilderness, the desert, for 40 years, so the story goes, um, to the promised land of Israel, okay? So how did he do that? Well, according to the Bible story, what happened was more or less God asked Moses to do this. God presented himself to Moses in a burning bush and said to Moses, I want you to do this. And Moses was reluctant. He's like, oh, my brother, you know, he's way better at talking to people. Um, why don't you ask him? <laughs> God doesn't want to ask him. Or, you know, he's picked Moses. Okay, so Moses has to comply, more or less. And then, what does he do to get the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt? Well, he has to, he scares the Egyptians on multiple occasions with miraculous plagues that God brings on them. You know, um, locusts come and eat up everything, and the river Nile turns into blood and scares the keepers out of people. And eventually, um, baby boys are killed in the process, and so eventually, after many plagues and many terrors, um, the Pharaoh lets these people go, all right? And then the miracles continue. So Moses leads them out of, um, out of Egypt, but in order to escape the Egyptian army, because Pharaoh's changed his mind again, um, and they're chasing them, Moses does this great miracle of parting the Red Sea that's a picture of Moses with the Ten Commandments. That's, that's the founding document. Um, so he parts the Red Sea. Uh, the Israelites go through. Um, and then the sea swallows up the Egyptian army. Okay? Get rid of the Egyptians. And the miracles don't stop there. Uh, as they're going towards the promised land, they meet up with all kinds of enemies, they have all kinds of hardships on their way, and there are many times where the uh, people want, they want to reject Moses' authority, and they start saying things like, you know, life was better in Egypt. We were slaves, but we had enough to eat. We knew where our next meal came from, and, you know, we, did, we might not starve or die at the hands of our enemies, so we want to go back. Or, or they would say, uh, we don't believe in your God because if your God was real, well, he would have done better by us by now. We'd already, we'd already be there. Why are we still suffering? And so they would turn to other gods like the golden calf or the um, god Baal and worship that god. And Moses would have to do something to remind them that the God that he followed was real, and so things like a pillar of fire would appear and guide the people on their way to where they needed to go. Manna was created, which is a type of food that just came down from the sky, fell on the ground that people could gather. Water, Moses made water come from a rock when there wasn't enough water, okay? And when that didn't work, Moses sometimes threatened people with God's wrath. Okay, And so he kept bringing people back. Now, the common denominator here is that Moses couldn't have gotten all of this done without God's help and without all of those miracles. This is the way it goes. The Bible doesn't say that you know, Moses was a great military leader or was a political genius. Quite the contrary. He's depicted as somebody who on his own doesn't really know how to do all that. So the stories are supposed to show the power of God, all right? So <clears throat> this was where Moses' authority came from. Now, I'll just mention one thing that you might, you know, might be a little confused by. Back in these times, that is in Moses' time, um, even the Hebrews thought in terms of multiple gods, okay? So this is why they were um, our God might not be as powerful as some other God, right? And they didn't think about switching, switching their champ, 
by the time we get to Machiavelli, monotheism has taken over, right, to the point where um, those who embrace it do, do not think about other gods that challenge them. There's only one. Okay. That made things a little harder for Moses in a way. What does Machiavelli say about Moses? Okay, well, in the beginning of chapter 6, Machiavelli says that Moses, of course, is a great leader, okay, and a founder. He's depicted throughout as a founding figure. Up at the top of my page 19, he says, we shouldn't even discuss Moses' skill because he was a mere agent following the instructions given him by God. That sounds very orthodox. In other words, that sounds like what a lot of Christians of Machia Machiavelli's day would, would want to hear and they would expect to hear. We shouldn't discuss Moses like he's a political and military leader because he's not just any political and military leader. He's this miracle worker, a prophet chosen by God, right? And his power came from there. And so Machiavelli says, so he should be admired not for his own skill, but for that grace that made him worthy to talk with God. And then he says, but let us discuss Cyrus and the others. Okay, Cyrus is a Persian king. And he mentions other founders here of ancient Rome, for instance, Romulus. So the chapter includes mentions of these people like Cyrus and Romulus who founded countries, right? So we would expect then for Machiavelli to do what? Would we expect him to talk about Moses some more after he said this, that uh, we should not discuss Moses' skill out of a sense of reverence and piety because Moses is a different type of leader? I mean, if you just take him at his word and you read this more or less uh, literally, yes, you would. But your brain would turn off and you wouldn't notice that he mentions Moses in the very next paragraph. Okay? But this is what Machiavelli really likes to do, is he likes to say something like that that kind of hits you on the surface and puts your brain to sleep in case you're not ready to find out more, because it's a multi-dimensional teaching. So for those who are reading carefully, when they read the next paragraph, he says, it was necessary for Moses to find the people of Israel in Egypt enslaved and oppressed by the Egyptians, so they, in order to escape from slavery, um, would be prepared to follow him. Any implications there? Any underlying uh, notions about why say Moses did what he did or how. He had to find a people who really wanted his leadership because they were miserable, right? Um, Ibn Khaldun, the golden, uh, golden age Islamic philosopher, um, used this term group feeling, right? And he said that people get group feeling when they're in harsh circumstances. In his case, you know, the nomadic desert tribes, right? Because they live under harsh circumstances and they're always um, possible victims of marauding enemies, right? They're much more likely to have group feeling and group feeling is absolutely essential, right, to their survival. Machiavelli's saying something similar here about the Israelites. They were put into a situation of suffering and desperation and this is why they had the gumption and the desire to follow Moses. And Moses kind of saw this and saw his opportunity to lead. Okay? Now that's a that's a very different thing to say than what he says above. Moses was following the instructions given him by God and should be admired for grace, the, the grace that he had to talk with God. This sentence here is more about his astuteness, his ability to perceive an opportunity, and the facts of life when it comes to human beings, that human beings will resist leadership if they're feeling great and everything seems under control, 
but when they're desperate they'll look for it and if you're astute enough if you're knowledgeable enough about human nature you will see your opportunity there where there is desperation okay this is a picture of Cyrus and he equates here I mean this is kind of what he said he wouldn't do he said I won't d discuss Moses I'll discuss these other guys in the next paragraph, he discusses Moses, and he, and he rolls right into the other guys, okay? Just like any other political leader, Moses is, is treated like just like any other political leader here. This is the type of thing that got Machiavelli into trouble with religious people. Does he seem to be, well, not terribly subtle, but somewhat subtly approaching, rewriting Bible stories like this, you know, reimagining what they were about. Right? So he's using the Bible story, but he's he's thinking like Machiavelli, like what actually happened, right, as opposed to <coughs> miracles. And this is, again, you know, the cynicism that's developing during the Renaissance and the focus on human things rather than on. Um, things of heaven, right? So um, this is another quote from later on in the same chapter. He says, much of the difficulty that leaders, speaking of leaders generally now, have in getting to power derives from the new institutions and customs they are obliged to establish in order to found their governments and make them secure. Okay, So that's a general statement, but it's a really good one because it repeats what he said previously in the book, right? Remember what Machiavelli said about new princes, and that's what Moses would be if we think of it like Machiavelli. What does, what does Machiavelli say in previous chapters about the difficulties that new princes face as opposed to hereditary princes and what they have to do different? The hereditary prince has to rule like the ones before him because that's the only way that those people will feel the really will feel comfortable with him, okay? So if you inherit your rule, that's what you do. But if you're a new prince and these people are not used to you, what do you have to do? Right? You have to be more, you, you've got a greater challenge because you're going to have to lay down new laws, new what Machiavelli calls modes and orders, which just means you have to set up a constitution of some kind or a set of laws. In Moses' case, this was, you know, first the Ten Commandments and then um, the laws that kind of like spooled out from the Ten Commandments that govern the people of Israel, okay? And so you have to do that, and then you have to make sure, remember, you have to make sure that the people that you're imposing your new modes and orders on don't disobey, and they're very prone. <coughs> he says they're very prone to do that, right? Because you're new, and unlike the hereditary prince, they question everything you do, they're insecure, right? This is especially true of Moses because he's making people wander around and face enemies for a long period of time. People, generation happened along the way, right? Some people died, other people were born during that big long trek. All right, and thirdly, then, in order to do that, a new prince is going to have to be well armed, and they're going to have to be willing to use cruelty when necessary. Okay. We'll talk more about this with Borgia on Wednesday, but even before this chapter, Machiavelli has said, you know, you they they have to nip resistance in the bud, right? They have to stop dissent before it starts. They can't wait for to figure out who is actually a friend and who's an enemy. They have to do things that will impress upon people the fact that they've got a lot of power and they're willing to use it, okay? So in light of that, this sentence makes more sense, right? New princes have a difficulty in taking and getting their power <coughs> because they have to put down new institutions and, they're, and they have to do what it takes uh, to make them secure. And that's what Lorenzo de' Medici did, the guy who took over from Florence and arrested Machiavelli 
and threw him in prison and tortured him and a lot of other people. And he did this almost immediately as a statement of his power, not a judicial proceeding. There wasn't any trial, okay? It was just, here I am, here's what I can do, don't disobey me. So, then, still in chapter 6, but coming towards the end, Moses gets mentioned again. Okay, here he is right here, along with these other, this is a Greek founder, these are Roman, Persian, okay, so founders of great ancient um, countries, nations, right? Um, speaking of this kind of successful prince, he says when he can stand on his own feet and can resort to force, then he can usually overcome the dangers he faces. But thus it is that all armed prophets are victorious and disarmed ones are crushed. Okay, let's just stop there for a moment. Think about that statement. He used the term prophets. Which one's a prophet? Okay. None of the rest of them, you know, like Romulus might not have even been a real person, but none of them were depicted as prophets. So what's he saying here when he says all armed prophets are victorious and disarmed ones are crushed? Um, those who lead have to have arms, they have to have power, and it might even be that they have to have real arms, <laughs> okay? In other words, there's a, this is a, this is a gray area, right? Where depending upon who you are and how you read this, you might see a slightly different interpretation even of how Moses got and kept his power. And again, there's the cynicism that's well enough, right? That can lead to a, what we now call a deconstruction or a reinterpretation of a text like the Bible to where somebody like Machiavelli may doubt whether miracles were actually what got Moses where he got, okay? So conceivably, Machiavelli is saying something really sacrilegious here, right? or unorthodox, at least unorthodox. And he's saying it in a way that will make people question um, their kind of orthodox or pious position um, about Moses. And then he doubles down on references to Moses. Now, thinking about Moses' story, take a look at more of what he says. He says there's another problem. People are by nature inconstant. It's easy to persuade them of something, but it's difficult to stop them from changing their minds. Who does that sound like? Yeah, the, the people of Israel, right? The Israelites. They were always changing their mind. We don't want to go forward. We want to go back. We don't want to worship your God. We want to worship Baal, all right? And then he says, you have to be prepared for the moment when they no longer believe. Then you have to force them to believe. Moses, Cyrus, Theseus, and Romulus would not have been able to make their people obey their new structures of authority for long if they had been unarmed. Now you could say Moses was armed with miracles, but at this point, that's not an obvious interpretation of what Machiavelli is saying, okay? So it's questionable whether that's what he's saying. And it's just as likely that he's saying that Moses must have done it with his arms. After all, he did have an army, okay? And so Machiavelli may be saying, you know, Moses is like the other founders, and for him to be able to do this, he had to use his arms, right, his military. All right, so there's a lot going on in here, and there's... Now, this is very characteristic of Renaissance and, and then going into early modern and modern thought, this questioning of sacred institutions, of not only religion and religious authority, but more and more like political authority as well. There's a, there's a questioning that develops in, about religion and the parallel questioning starts when it comes to aristocracy because in the minds of medieval people, God and the aristocracy were kind of like this, okay? Like the aristocracy and the king got their power from God and the church, okay? But 
starting with the renaissance there's a questioning of the orthodox positions on god and the bible and all of that and there was a parallel questioning starting with authority and where it came from and you definitely see that both of them in machiavelli's prince right because even though this is a book about princes we're going to find out that authority for machiavelli does not come from god okay it's not because the but because the church puts the crown on the prince that makes him have that authority it comes from the prince's own skill and ability and tangible power okay so all of this is is you know in the mix when it comes to this treatment of Moses and believe me the you know the idea that Machiavelli would use Moses as an example and do it in this way would have seemed really surprising to anybody which is most people at the time who believed in God okay and would have and did raise alarm bells okay Machiavelli just was not orthodox some people thought that he wasn't even a Christian maybe he was an atheist because of the way that he wrote about these things and more so the way that he wrote about the church right and the figures from the church right? he tended to treat religious figures like political actors and he tended to see religion as a political and social tool rather than a reality now if if you asked him if he was here and we could somehow interview him and you said Machiavelli do you believe in God he'd probably say sure I go to church I go to church on Sunday right so and he very well could have it really doesn't change the fact that he that he writes about religion as a social and political tool and that's what's most important to Machiavelli. Right? Religion can be a means of getting that group feeling or social control, keeping people motivated, right? Machiavelli is beginning a long history of questioning the role of religion and what it's for in Western political thought religion just becomes more and more problematic as time goes by for Western political thought there's some lessons that we can draw already just from reading chapter 6 <clears throat> that Machiavelli wants us to get across <coughs> wants us to absorb okay. he says at the very end um, about this other figure the hero of Syracuse um, that he did not depend on luck once he had been given his opportunity. Okay. Don't depend on luck. Okay. Or grace is a term that he uses here. Okay. Machiavelli probably is not going to ever advise somebody to just hope that God helps them out, even if God is there. Okay. There's a constant thrust of his argument rely on yourself rely on your own capabilities hone them you know take control of the situation right through the use of your mind and your courage you can get these things done right so don't rely on luck and he'll elaborate on that this is the goddess of fortuna and later on in the book this is a roman goddess he refers to her basically the goddess of luck or chance and he actually says that you can dominate the goddess of luck or chance okay that, that a human being does not have to just say oh you know I, I was destined to have this to not have this power or to have this situation you can change it okay and then another lesson is we're beginning to see a teaching and he'll develop this more that a leader can use religion to motivate obedience now these days we still see that but more and more we see ideology right from the from really the 19th century on ideology has been what what has been used to motivate people but it's a similar function you know you come up with a belief system that people can 
put all their heart and soul into and put their identity into. And once you get them, um, you know, believing in that, then it's easier for you to get them to do what you want them to do as a leader. Ideologies are just as powerful as religions, maybe one could argue even more so. And they serve psychically a lot of the same function. So this advice still would hold true, right? If you want power, have a powerful ideology and or use uh, religion because it will motivate people in a very emotional way. Um, and obedience will be at the forefront, right? Because either the authority of God or the authority of the leader and ideas impresses on people. All right? There again, we have that golden cap in the background. Right? <laughs> um, another lesson that we can draw from this, which we'll hear more about too, is a good leader, a successful leader, needs to be willing to use intimidation and force against new, the new people they rule. Not just against enemies, external enemies, that's a no-brainer, of course they do, but they have to be willing to use it against their own people. Now, in the discourses, that longer book that he wrote, he spent more time on how the Romans did this because he really admired the ancient Romans for how that they used their religion, which was polytheistic. And Machiavelli tended to think polytheism was easier to use than a monotheistic religion with a book because conceivably people might, even though at the time many people couldn't read Latin or anything else, conceivably they could read it for themselves. But secondly, they, you know, when hearing the stories, they could think about them for themselves. So it was more difficult, um, especially since Christianity was a religion that uh, emphasized forgiveness and meekness and things like that. Machiavelli would have preferred pagan religion because it had multiple gods, and many of the gods encouraged warlike behavior, which is more what you need, in his view, to keep a country strong and powerful. Okay? Um, so Machiavelli actually says in the discourses that the Romans had this great thing that they used to motivate people when the nation was about to go to war to motivate the troops. The priests would come out. I yes, right, thank you, Mars. Um, and they would either, you know, disembowel some animal and take a look at the entrails and read them and say, uh, yes, it's a good day to go to war. Or they, they'd uh, throw some grain out on the, on the floor of the temple and haul out the chickens, and if the chickens ate the grain, which, by the way, chickens will always eat the grain. It doesn't matter, like, how little you feed them, they're going to eat that. <laughs> but if the chickens ate the grain, well, then it was a good day to go to war. If for some reason we had to cancel, you had to rig the situation a little bit more. When it comes to reading the entrails, nobody but the priests know, right? So there would, there would always be a way for the right answer to come out. And this was an institution in Roman religion that Machiavelli admires, that the priests were able to help the government to coalesce emotional force around going to war or whatever it is they wanted to do using people's religious beliefs. Okay. Machiavelli would probably call that superstitions, but it doesn't really matter. Right? It motivated sound really cynical? Yes, it was, right? Um, so on the one hand, he's acknowledging <coughs> that religion has a great deal of power in people's minds, but at the same time, he's using it in his own political thought in a kind of secular way. And then finally, we learn the lesson just from chapter six, and this gets repeated too, drop old friends and choose new ones. Machiavelli is very big on when you, when you Gain power that you didn't have before. You've got to shake everything up. Okay? If there are nobles in this area who have been living in luxury for a long time, those people are going to be a problem, so you take all their property away. Okay? And you give some of it to other people, and you distribute it in a way that you don't create any more rich, powerful people. Okay? Because they're always a problem. 
They always will challenge your power. So you level the playing field and you help new friends, but Machiavelli never advises people for a prince to, for instance, uh, give anybody enough land and wealth that they can raise an army of their own. He did not like the so-called prince baron system, okay? Which is the idea that you, you know, the prince rules, but he's got an army full of nobles with their own vassals, their own armies. They're private armies, basically. Um, why? Because those armies can become, can challenge your power. Rather, he proposed the idea of having one army and disarming those folks, the nobles, okay? Totally makes sense. Why would you have a bunch of people with arms and capable of using them that don't necessarily support your rule? Or only do if you keep handing out goodies to them, right? So this is a very different type of teaching. In chapter six, we get a lot of unorthodox stuff about religion. We get a lot of unconventional advice about how to deal with people. This would not be the way most writers, they'd say, you know, the powerful people are the ones you need to get to know. Okay. And you all form a club and rule. Right. And Machiavelli say, no, nope, not if you want to keep your power. You need to, you need to cut those people down to size. Right. That is not the typical advice. Um, but it's going to become more and more so. I guess I want to impress on you, Machiavelli very much represents the beginning, the kernel of ideas that just get bigger and bigger and roll out and become huge. 